Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Office of State Archaeology's uh, next lunchtime lecture in our October Archaeology Month lecture series. Today, we'll be hearing from Tane Casserly, who's presenting on behalf of himself and Chris Southerly on the topic of exploring underwater cultural heritage in North Carolina. Uh, Tane is the Maritime Archaeologist and Research Coordinator with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, and is a graduate of our own East Carolina University from their Maritime Studies Department. Um, so we'll be talking today about some of the maritime heritage of North Carolina um, and all that our ocean has to offer here. Um, and later in the month, we encourage you to join us for more programs. Next week, we have a lecture from Jeff Hughes on Moravian pottery and a public archaeology day on Saturday, October 27th. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Tani Casserly. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your lunch time with me today. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be speaking to you about North Carolina's maritime heritage, and I have to apologize that I don't have my co-presenter, uh, Chris Southerly, from the Underwater Archaeology Branch, but I'm sure we're going to plan to do this talk again. Um, so just to give you a little background for the state's maritime heritage uh, and who kind of oversees what, so the state of North Carolina extends its state bottom lands about three miles offshore. And then past that actually goes into federal waters. And we manage a site that's 16 miles offshore, and that would be the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the civil wire and clad USS Monitor. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. It's a very small sanctuary. It's our nation's first sanctuary, and it's the smallest. It's only a one mile uh, diameter sphere, essentially around the shipwreck itself that lays in 232 feet of water. So we've been there for um, about 46 years now, and we are now looking at expanding that site to include the other offshore resources, namely World War II's Battle of the Atlantic shipwrecks. That includes ships from the Allied navies, the US Navy, merchant mariners from around the world, and German U-boats, of course. So um, we're part of NOAA. You might know us as the National Weather Service from our storms lately. Uh, that's one of our missions. We also chart the uh, seafloor with our NOAA charts. And we have a small program called the National Marine Sanctuaries. And think of us as America's underwater national parks. We're all across the country. We're in the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, the Pacific, and in the far, in the far Pacific with um, two monuments in, out in Samoa and at the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It's called the Papahanao Mokokea Marine National Monument. They're made to primarily protect I think what America does best is protect our natural and cultural resources. So, but there's only two sites that protect just shipwrecks. That's the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off of Cape Hatteras and the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in the Great Lakes in uh, Lake Huron. But we're the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, the first one. I think of it as the jewel in the crown. And so we're very proud to protect that ship's history it's, it's archives, but also the physical remains. And that includes two sailors, too, that we recovered from the site itself. So a little story about the Monitor. It's something we all grew up knowing about, but, but, what, but what was it? Why was it so important? And it's because this ship changed naval warfare forever. If we look at this image and how strange it looks, you know, we have to think what ships were like back in that time period. Um, think of, like, Pirates of the Caribbean and those tall ships with the guns that were on the side of the vessel. So if it got into any kind of conflict or warfare, it had to fire from the side of the vessel. It means the whole ship has to move. What made this vessel revolutionary was that round turret and the top, that gun turret, that could move independently, and that's the forefather to every modern naval gun today. Uh, she's also prominent in history because if you look how strange she looks, all the working spaces were underneath the water line. You know, people are used to walking around on deck, right? You're up in the rigging, you're in the sails. Everybody worked underneath this steel hull. Inside this, essentially, was a steel coffin. So this vessel really was, almost think of it as a semi-submersible, semi, uh, excuse me, because people worked underneath the water line. So very revolutionary at its time. And it was built 
to fight what was known as the USS Merrimack, which was actually burned in the Gosport Navy Yard by the North. The South was coming up. They didn't want the South getting that vessel. The North evacuated. Before they did that, they burned the U.S. steam frigate, USS Merrimack. It went down right off um, the pier there at the Gosport Navy Yard. The South coming in didn't have a Navy, so they had to take advantage of whatever they could. They didn't have the industrial might to build these type of ships, so they scavenged and salvaged what they could. They raised the, the remains of the Merrimack, rebuilt it to what you see there next to the monitor, so a very different kind of vessel. And no, 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 most prominently from the Battle of Hampton Roads, and this is the first time these two ironclad vessels fought head to head. So on March 8th of 1862, during its maiden voyage, the very first time the ship actually left the dock, the CSS Virginia steams out out of Gosport Navy Yard into the central area that's in between Newport News, Norfolk, and Portsmouth, and attacks the Union fleet. So remember, it's, it's this metal ship going against these wooden walls, these wooden, these wooden warships, and it decimated it. So this is the worst defeat for the United States before Pearl Harbor. So this vessel in its maiden voyage comes out and attacks 12 ships, damages all 12, and sinks about seven of them, uh, kills over 200 men before it finally swings back and comes back to port again. In comparison, the, the vessel was basically undamaged and lost about eight men due to shot. So you can see just the devastating effects that this wooden, war, this metal warship had. I mean, it came right into some of the vessels with a ram bow, this big iron ram that had the, the bow, and plowed right into the warships and could fire point blank. So it, it was just terrible. Nothing could stop it. So the monitor steams into Hampton Roads that night, March 8th, and the scene it comes in is just carnage and the burning ships are illuminating its way into harbor. So it comes in and takes up position to the stranded USS Minnesota. That was one of the last warships left, but it was stranded in shallow waters where the Virginia couldn't get it. And its job, sole job was to protect that ship. It wasn't to sink the Virginia, it wasn't to attack the Virginia, just protect those Union warships. And that's what happened on March 9th. So the two vessels met, they fought for about four hours at point blank range, like this, this image you see is an exaggeration. They actually rammed each other at certain points, um, but their cannon shot couldn't penetrate the armor. So even though that day ended in a draw, it did signal the end of wooden warships and ushered in modern naval warfare. And that's why the ship is so important. So um, both the Virginia and Monitor had a pretty short lifespan, about less than a year. The Virginia, uh, later on, after the Battle of Hampton Roads, um, tried to draw out the Monitor for another battle. Monitor wasn't, wasn't having it. Monitor tried to drive out the, the Virginia and bring them out. Uh, the Virginia wouldn't have it because these two vessels were so iconic for either side. So eventually, the northern forces came back into the area, re retook the southern areas in Portsmouth and Gosport. The south didn't want the north to get the ship, so they blew it up, essentially, off an area called Crindy Island, and it's, it's gone today. The monitor uh, lasted a bit longer until it was being moved from Norfolk down to Beaufort, North Carolina, to uh, be part of the blockading efforts further south and, and in South Carolina, where it encounters a storm. So from the image, it was actually under tow by the paddle wheeler behind it, the USS Rhode Island, where they started the, uh, the voyage with uh, fair seas, you know, not much wind, and then it kept building and building. And if you remember what the monitor looked like, she only had about a foot above the water line. So she started encountering 12-foot waves, 15-foot waves, 20-foot waves, and eventually her pumps just couldn't overtake it. The water was coming in, and she was coal-fired with her boilers. The water was cooling the boilers. It couldn't run the pumps, couldn't run the engines. So you'll see on top of the turret in this image, there's a red signal lantern that they rose up, signaling they're going to abandon ship. So the Rhode Island came over with their longboats and started evacuating the men. Um, those men who did that, that brave... Um, Deed won the uh, Medal of Honor because it was such an arduous journey saving the Monitor's crew. But unfortunately, 16 men did go down with the ship on December 31st of 1862. So the Monitor really, um, for over about 110 years, 113 years, lay on the seafloor, unknown. No one knew where she was, just somewhere off Cape Hatteras, until a team in 1973 led by Duke University uh, MIT, National Geographic, and individuals from this very office, the North uh, Carolina Department of Cultural Resources, 
went out to search for the Monitor. Uh, one of it was from a love of history, wanting to refine this vessel, but also this is during the Cold War, so a lot of these equipment they're using, this cutting edge equipment to find objects of the seafloor were also used to find Russian subs and things like that. So by proving the technology that they could find the Monitor, which is a very unique shape, which means you could find other unique shapes on the seafloor. So finally, on August 27th of 73, on the last day of the project, as it always happens on the very last day, they find on their sonar what's called a long amorphous echo. So they did find 23 other sites, but this is the last one, and this is the one that actually ended up being the monitor. So it wasn't exactly what they, what they pictured. They didn't picture the ship to be upside down, because she actually is. They thought it'd be upright with a turret on top, so it didn't have a turret. So they put drop cameras down on her, and bring back this image. So they're able to see the waist of the vessel, the armor belt, you can see part of the deck, and then underneath it now, that's the turret going out. So now when they see this image, they figure, okay, we, we think we have it now. So in 1974, they make the official announcement, they found the monitor. So the question was though, it's 16 miles offshore, state waters go only three miles, what do you do at this site? It's extremely famous, it's been in National Geographic, Everybody knows about it, how do you protect it? So luckily enough, in 1972, there's something called the National Marine Sanctuaries Act was passed. Um, NOAA was a brand new federal organization. This is a brand new act, kind of, uh, and it came into being because of the Clean Water Act and some of these other things came about trying to clean the ocean. It wasn't initially created to protect shipwrecks, but it did have a clause in there to protect um, items of historical, archeological, cultural value. So it was actually the governor of North Carolina, James Holzhauer, who actually asked the federal government, can you protect this wreck? Can it be a sanctuary? And, and uh, January 30th, 1975, the 113th anniversary of the ship's launch, it becomes our nation's first national marine sanctuary. So being that North Carolina in this office, the Department of Cultural Resources had such a prominent role, they actually led the first investigations in the site with, with NOAA and the federal government. So it was uh, Dr. Gordon Watts and um, Richard Lawrence, from this office archaeologist from back in the day, actually dove in this submersible, the Johnson Sea Link, and they did lockout dives. You know, it's almost think of it like going to Mars in a way where they were or in the submersible on the bottom, a hatch would open, they would put on a hard hat, and you can see a tether there that's feeding a mare and, um, and, and comms and they would go out and do a land excavation underwater. So this is total cutting edge archeology span happening back in the 70s. And we started looking at it, mapping the site and recovering those iconic artifacts. So one of the first ones, that red signal lantern, the last thing anybody saw on the night it went down, that was the first artifact anybody saw actually laying just off the bow in the sand. So that was recovery during those expeditions and uh, was actually um, conserved by the Smithsonian, I believe. And then a little bit later, they recovered the anchor that was there as well. That was actually done in East Carolina back in 1983. And now we're starting to bring up these iconic pieces of the wreck. What do we do with it? Where do they go? So we actually put in the Federal Register a call out. So what museum or institution can actually handle this material? And um, the only one to reply was the Mariner's Museum uh, in Park in Newport News, Virginia back in the day. So back in 1887, that became our hub. So because the battle happened there, the monitor had so much of our life there, they became sort of archival and, and ar archeological um, venue. So we started a long relationship with them, but also recognizing the importance of monitor to North Carolina. So in recognition of that, and they were doing studies realizing that monitor, monitor being an iron ship in salt water, uh, is starting to corrode. She's starting to fall apart. The corrosion was, they believed, was accelerating to the point the monitor wouldn't exist in about 50 years. So we know now that that's not true, but it did spur an effort to do these major artifact recoveries. So again, working with the state of North Carolina, with the United States Navy, and um, some uh, marine salvage contractors, we actually brought up large sections of the hull, the engine drive train, the propeller, and that iconic gun turret. So, and that's, that's that, the very world's first rotating gun turret, the thing that changed naval history forever. So after we had done the excavations and removed the material above the turret, we actually were on a 300 foot barge and dropped this giant spider structure around the turret itself. 
and with the recognition that the turret was actually upside down, so it wasn't made to be a load-bearing structure, so we very gently picked it up and then moved it to a platform and locked it down together so those, contacts would, those contents would be held together and mated so when they came up, it would be one signal unit. So this happened over a 45-day mission, and this is the heaviest archaeological lift ever conducted when it broke the surface at 230 tons um, on August 5th, 2002. So as we all know, um, working in the historical cultural fields, that it's very exciting to go out and do the digs or the excavations or the dives, but that's not where the world the real work begins. The real work begins back in the lab. So for us, we had to do the, con the not just the conservation, but the excavation of this thing. So the, mod the turret is 11 feet tall and 22 feet across and filled with God knows what, but it's all incredibly important. So again, working with our partners at the Mirrors Museum, the state of North Carolina, we excavated the whole thing on land. And it was amazing the things that we found inside it. You know, we found personal items. We found items related to the battle. We found items from warfare. We found things you didn't expect, like silverware um, or other kind of things, or pocket knives. But again, working with the Mariners Museum, we were able to build the Monitor Center. We have a full-scale replica of the ship in front of it so people can walk the decks. But what's really important to me is telling those personal stories about those individuals on the ship. So one of the individuals that we found inside the turret, there was two of them. One of them had a gold wedding band on. They still had their great coats on, their woolen great coats with the U.S. Navy buttons on them. They were wearing boots, clothing. You know, they had uh, relish and mustard and pepper bottles, just like MREs today have a, a Tabasco in there, tastes a little better. Well, food was uh, maybe not quite as good in the Civil War that they were issued, so anything you could get on your food to uh, help it be a little more palatable, they had. And I mentioned that silverware, too. We found a lot of silverware, and a lot of it was engraved. But what was interesting, it was the engravings were only from individuals that were lost during the sinking event. So a lot of these guys, you weren't issued silverware, you actually brought your own a lot of times and you could keep track because of the initials in it. But again, it's telling those people's stories, all these individuals. So it's not just the ship and the battle and, and those events, but it's also you drill down deeper and really get to know the folks that lived and breathed on these ships. But then we can't, we can't forget the larger process we have of conservation. So I, as I mentioned, this is the heaviest metals lift in history. So now we have to deal with these items. So one of them being very complex is the monitor's engine, custom designed by John Erickson to fit in his monitor. And just like engines today, there's multiple parts. They're very complex. There's different materials. Those all have to be conserved differently, disassembled, fully conserved, and then rebuilt again. So this is a very long process. But to just show you the progress we've made so far, so this is starting in 2010, and I'll just take you through where we are today. There we are, just last year. So she's fully deconcreted on the outside now, and now we begin the, the process of taking apart each bolt and each piece, and they'll go individual um, through an individual conservation process now. And this engine's probably weighs 15 tons, and it's probably about 10 feet tall by about 30 feet long. So it's it's a massive piece of metal. And the turret, the real prize that we 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 went after, we had to completely excavate all the way down take all the material out of it, take the guns out, take the carriages out, take all the implements out, and now deal with the structure itself. And, um, you know, we can do the best we can mapping this by hand, but we always turn to partners. So we actually work with NASA and some other groups to laser scan the uh, turret because that's going to give us the most accurate representation of that, so we're very lucky to be able to do that. And then we're also, it's going through classic electrolytic reduction just like you do on the Queen's Anne Revenge, it's exactly the same process, just a lot bigger. So this is the first sort of structure that we put in there for the electrodes, and then always keeping up with the most current um, processes and methods. This is the structure we just put in to make sure we get a nice even coverage to get the salts out of that material. Um, to give you an idea of the time scale we're working on, the engine came up in 2001. It'll probably take an additional 20 years to finish that. Um, 
the turret came up in 2002, and that'll probably take another 15 years or so to finish that one before it can fully go on, on display. But um, again, just some of the challenges we're going through with these items. But in the monitor center at the Mirrors Museum, where this is in a full lab that's viewable by the public with big glass planes with the recognition that we don't want to keep the public out. We want them to be able to see these things going conservation. There's no sense in putting it behind a wall. And we can't forget those two individuals that we, we excavated as well. We don't know who they are exactly, but we're still honor their memory. We tried to um, identify them using mitochondrial DNA, but we weren't able to find a descendant. Um, and, but with the full knowledge that they are due their military honors, we worked with the Department of the Navy in Veteran Affairs, and we were able to intern them at um, Arlington National Cemetery in uh, 2013, 151 years after the battle. And the monitor is still a vibrant shipwreck site today. We did recover a portion of the stern area, the engine, um, and the, the sort of the working drivetrain. But the rest of the vessels there, so all the living spaces, the working spaces where the men worked and breathed, are still down there. There's still more stories to be told. And it's just a beautiful dive site. So we do everything we can to try to get people out there to experience the site. And if they can't get to the site, we'll bring the site to them. So you can see, originally for years, we just looked at Monitor as a little dot off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. You know, it's, and then we had focused so much on the excavations and the history there that we almost had blinders on to the other history happening off North Carolina. So now that we're able to take a, a little breath from Monitor and really start looking at the other wonderful uh, shipwrecks and history we have off there, with the recognition of World War II, the impact that it had off North Carolina. This is a story that some of us know, but a lot of people in America don't. And that's a testament to the US uh, War Department's efforts to sort of keep the story under wraps, because they didn't want to terrorize the public to let them know how close the enemy was coming to our home front. So this is the story we're starting to tell now. And people wonder, like, how did this even begin? How did, wh why are these wrecks here? Why are the Germans attacking us off North Carolina? is because a lot of World War II was a naval war. It's the longest protracted uh, battle of the entire war actually happened here off our east coast. People don't realize that. And it begins on the same day that war begins in World War II. So September 3rd, 1939, war is declared in Europe. That's the very first day of the Battle of the Atlantic, at the very first sinking. So the first casualty you have is the SS Athenia, sunk by the U-130, or the U-30, excuse me, in the North Sea, and it goes from there. And people don't realize how critical these convoys were coming from North America and refueling the war effort for the allies in Europe. You know, we refueled them, the United States and Canada. We're the ones who sent them food and petroleum and oil and gas and those war materials. They all came from us. So we had to get the, our, essentially our convoys going across to do that. So that starts just days after war is declared on the 16th of 1939. And then we have a little bit later where now those European allied forces are being pushed entirely out of the continent of Europe, which leaves Great Britain standing all by itself. You guys seen the movie Dunkirk, The Darkest Hour, they sort of talk about those events. But we have to realize our allied forces, our partners are completely pushed out of the continent now. So that Great Britain is now completely stands by itself, solely dependent on us to keep them alive. And that's why the convoys are so important. And that's why the Germans literally sent their war to our front. Um, but we weren't brought into the war, of course, until December 7th of 41, 755. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Now, we all know that happened on December 7th, 1941, but the Germans didn't actually declare war on the United States until December 11th, 1941. We didn't declare war on them. And we would think that the Japanese and Germans being allies would have coordinated this attack. They did not. So that's why it actually took the Germans by surprise, because they had an initial um, plan to send 30 Type 9 U-boats to attack our coast once war was declared. They were unprepared for that, so they were only able to send seven Type 7 
U-boats here, which are smaller and had less capacity. So those are the first weapons of war that actually come under our coast. That happens just weeks after the war is declared. January 11th, 1942, the first U-boats are now showing up off the eastern seaboard. They come across to New York, down to New Jersey, and of North Carolina. This is called Operation Drumbeat, and that was the first of many um, U-boat waves that came over to the United States, causing devastation. We were totally unprepared for this onslaught. And one of the reasons why North Carolina was hardest hit, you know, the Battle of Atlantic was, is in Africa, it was in the North Sea, uh, off Canada, the Mid-Atlantic here in the Gulf of Mexico, but what makes North Carolina so unique, and it was such a hot hunting ground and the wreck so close to shore, is because of the continental shelf. It's the closest to land off North Carolina and the Outer Banks. So what these U-boats would do, they would come across from Laureate, France, in deep water where they could hide. They, we didn't have coastal blackouts at the time, so our cities are brightly lit. So they would wait until night and wait for the convoys to come by and they would look for the shadow and when that silhouette comes up, they would pop up, come into shallow water, shoot and kill our men, and then sink, and then come back out into deeper water again. So they're doing these hit-and-run campaigns, and we were complete sitting ducks. And also, the shipping lanes tighten up around North Carolina. As they're coming up and down the coast, moving commerce, they tighten up out there because they have to push out a bit. So we'll see now the shipping lanes from World War II, and then we'll overlap, overlap that with the known World War II sites so the Germans knew exactly where to hit us. This is very easy for them. So during all of World War II, a total of 90 ships were lost off North Carolina alone. That's an incredible number. 78 merchant ships, eight Allied Navy ships, and four German U-boats. It's amazing. No one knew this back in World War II. Um, so a lot of these vessels are now protected under the, something called the Sunken Military Craft Act. Those Allied warships, both British and American, are protected. The German U-boats are still protected. But it's those 78 merchant ships that we really want to talk about and preserve because those are not protected. And a lot of these ships have 70, 80 guys still entombed inside them. So this is one of the reasons we really want to expand our site to help protect these areas. And of the 1,657 total World War II casualties of North Carolina, over 1,200 of those were merchant mariners. That's really the story we're trying to tell. But we also had really important victories off North Carolina as well. Very first successes we had in the whole war effort happened right here off our shores. So the first one on April 14th of 42, the USS Roper sinks the U-85 off North Carolina. That's the very first U-boat sunk by the U.S. Navy off the United States eastern seaboard. We also have on May 9th of 42, the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Icarus sinks the U-352 U off North Carolina. This is the first U-boat sunk by the Coast Guard anywhere in World War II. Happened right off our shores. And then on July 7th of 42, an A-29 Lockheed uh, Hudson bomber sank the U-701 off Cape Hatteras. This is the very first U.S. Army Air Force uh, kill of a U-boat off the United States East Coast. We don't, we don't realize that, but these successes, these victories, helped push back against the Germans the momentum and actually helped push them back across the seas. And one of the last big battles that happened with the U-boats was just a little bit later on July 15th of 42, where the U-576, the previous day, had got into an interaction with a ship, uh, tried to attack it with their torpedoes. They were unsuccessful. That vessel drops um, depth charges on the, the U-576, damaging its dive planes and its ballast system. So the ballast system, which allows it to ascend and descend. So they felt like they had things fixed, and they're actually on their way back to Germany when they encounter this convoy, KS-520 off Cape Hatteras. Um, so they come in, see the convoy, they actually fire four torpedoes at the convoy. They hit three ships. Um, but what happens at the same point, because those torpedoes are quite big with a lot of weight to them, because of the change in the, uh, the, the buoyancy of the, the sub, it actually pops up right into the middle of the convoy. So three ships are hit, one ship goes down immediately, the SS Bluefields, and then everybody counterattacks against the U-boat. Everybody opens up. So they have air cover, dropping depth charges, our merchant ships and Navy ships are now hitting it, and it goes down in about 10 minutes. So what we have here is really a World War II battlefield, 
not just what the event's happening on the surface, but two ships actually on the bottom side by side. This is the first place anywhere in the United States that this occurs, and this is right off Cape Hatteras. So these were unknown sites. So to be able to tell this World War II story, we wanted to go out and actually find these sites. So um, we did have the records from the Navy, and after a few years of searching, we actually found what we believed was the Blue Fields. That was the one vessel that went down. She's a weird looking sort of freighter. You can kind of see it has almost look like what looks like a crane in the midships there and the crane in the stern to move cargo. It's very sort of unique. Well, when we got the sonar image, we thought, wow, you know, this looks like the same length, the same breadth, the same width, uh, and it looks like it has two cranes on it. So we did a more in-depth survey with uh, an AUV, which is an autonomous underwater vehicle. Think of it like a smart torpedo. It scanned the bottom and it came up with this. So the image on the right-hand side is the blue, like, yeah, right-hand side there, is the blue fields, the larger image, and then you have that thin little image next to it. I mean, it could be a rocky ridge, you know, it could be sand, or it could be a U-boat. So we were able to go back again, and we actually took a really in-depth look at it, downloaded the data, and this is what we found. So this is probably the most intact um, representation of a Type 7C U-boat anywhere on the seafloor, anywhere in the world. Everything is still there, it's perfectly intact, it's still entombed with its crew um, in about 800 feet of water. So it's, it's, it's amazing. This is exactly what we had in the shallower water here off Carolina um, before, unfortunately, um, artifacts were taken from them. So we went out, we got a very large grant with a group called the Office of Ocean Exploration. We worked with a diving group called the Global Underwater Explorers. They have a boat called Project Baseline um, in the Baseline Explorer with two small submersibles. So we went out there and actually looked at the two U-boats for the first time with human eyes in about 75 years. So that's what this is. So these submersibles, um, honestly, they're tourist subs that people are making if you're very wealthy. Sometimes they have this on your, on your yacht. Um, you got a pilot inside it and a scientist. We put cameras all over it as well as a laser scanner. They were very nice and let us put our, our logos on the side. This isn't our sub, by the way. So, um, but to put human eyes down there and actually physically interact with the site. So it's, it's, very, it's very special. So this is the bow of the U-576. Everything is there except we have one side of a hull plate that has fallen off. The only thing missing is the wooden deck slats of the deck. You can see on top, the guns, everything are still there. So that's the conning tower. I might kind of actually look inside it a little bit here. And all the hatches are still dogged down, meaning this is still a tomb for those German sailors. They're still inside it, about 45 guys. And that light underneath it is the laser scanning that we did. There's the stern of it. It's the aft dive planes and the propellers. And then the, the merchant ship, the Bluefields, right next to it, 200 yards away. There's the bow, the, the, the hawse pipes where the anchors came out of. All that deck machinery, the cranes, the winches, all still there. You can see the sort of the more winches, and the, there's a cargo hold, you can see the aft cabin. So we can see that even though this, this vessel went down in time of war, the preservation this deep is, is astounding. Um, it, was, it was pretty funny that uh, it was hit amidships, the center of the vessel, and cracked open. So we go down there and look at the contents of the hull is spilled out. And it was all these, these white sort of porcelain items. We couldn't figure out what they were, but uh, it was actually carrying a cargo load of toilets that was on its way to Europe that had spilled out. <laughs> which is the funniest thing ever to see. Um, and of course, the fishermen knew about these sites. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know if it was a rocky ledge because um, the fishermen always know where these sites are. Um, so we share the information that, hey, yeah, these are great World War II uh, resources and you know, fish and enjoy, just don't damage it. And then we just went back out to the sites again this summer with our NOAA ship, Nancy Foster. It has slightly higher technology. And this is the newest multi-beam sonar scan that we have of the site, so much higher resolution. But you know, we can look at this and really tell that one's a merchant freighter and the other one 
is a German U-boat, you know. So this is such a great visualization of a World War II battlefield here off North Carolina, the only one anywhere in the United States where they both went down during the same action. So it's, it's a very special place. And as North Carolinians, we should all be very proud of this. But getting back to the war, so all those events happened in 42, and about that six months of the war, that's when those 90 ships went down. You know, then we came back and we had, um, we actually started uh, implementing the convoy system. We had coastal blackouts. We improved our Navy, uh, our, our air coverage. You know, we did these things. So by May of that year, or excuse me, the following year, we're really pushing back against the Germans now. And by pushing back, we pushed it back against them all the way across the Atlantic. And I, I truly believe that the successes we had here, first off North Carolina, kept pushing back across the Atlantic and made D-Day happen in 1944. And if we didn't have the successes here and that pushback that we did and those successes, that events never would have happened in that year. And Lord only knows the kind of world we live in today. So again, something that we should be very proud of that happened first here in North Carolina. So our efforts now are to preserve this World War II battlefield. We want people to dive it. We want people to interact with it. We're just asking that folks, if we are able to expand our sanctuary to protect these sites, just don't take anything and just don't damage the shipwrecks. And that's it. You know, but we work with North Carolina, the state of North Carolina, on nearly every level. Uh, we've worked very strongly with the maritime museums here. Since 2000, we've given the museum system $2.7 million to help with the Battle of the, um, excuse me, the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum, uh, with trail signage, um, exhibit design. We have a whole uh, heritage trail system that we build, talking about monitoring World War II. Work a lot with the museum in Beaufort, too, of course. Um, our heritage trail system that goes all the way from North Carolina all the way up to New York where the monitor was actually built and everywhere in between were interacted. We have a huge outreach and community program where we actually made videos about the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So you can go to our website and click on any of these videos and learn about things like World War II, World War I, Monitor, the Pea Island Life Saving Station, and all those events too that are so important for our coastal communities. We have the only data buoy that's out there is actually on the, note, on the monitor. So it's a great resource for fishermen or other mariners and divers to know what the conditions are like out there. Um, and one of the things that we're really proud of is, is bringing the public into our world. So we do it in a few different ways. One of it is NAS, which is the Nautical Archaeology Society, where we'll actually teach divers and members of the public how to help us map a shipwreck and how to, how to feel ownership and protective of the wreck and what they can do to, to help protect it for the future. So we've worked with a lot of dive shops to do that and um, local communities too, as well as East Carolina University. And partnering with local businesses, um, a project called Anchor, which is appreciating our nation's cultural heritage and ocean resources. So I'll actually work with local dive shops and we'll talk about positive ways they can interact with shipwrecks with the recognition that these wrecks are historic resources, but they're also economic resources. You know, these are big draws from around the world because people want to dive on these things and to fish on them, and they should but just trying to show ways we can do that responsibly and the benefits for local tourism. And the aquarium system, you know, we recognize that we love the wrecks, but the wrecks are also habitat for marine life. So we have a new exhibit we did with the Roanoke Island Aquarium where it's called the Ironclad Sanctuary. You learn about monitor. We have a, a, a third scale monitor inside one of the tanks. Uh, we actually have this, um, sort of virtual reality turret you can go in to learn more about the sinking and the battle itself and, and the other wrecks off North Carolina. And what was really exciting is that we had just worked with the Battleship North Carolina in Wilmington and we had a movie night. So what other ways can we interact with the community? Well, why not bring a giant blow up screen, talk a little bit about historic preservation and then show them a fun World War II movie for the whole family. So we try to do more and more of these things too to show value to what, what, what we're doing and be good partners with the community. Um, so we always direct people to our website to learn more about our heritage. We, we always share everything. Our newest data is up there. You want coordinates, it's there. You want videos, it's all yours. So, but our goal with all of this, with the monitor and all these other wrecks, is to protect these fragile historic resources for the future generations and to preserve the memory of the brave allied servicemen and the U.S. merchant mariners 
who fought to rid the world of tyranny, and that we never forget the sacrifices that all those who work offshore have gone through. And thank you very much. There's a, I'm happy to answer any questions, if anybody has any questions at all. Um, have you tried working with, or has anybody been interested um, from some sort of cultural resources um, department in Germany? Are there like any schools or anything interested in their U-boats? Yeah, well, they are. So we, we work very closely with the German embassy in DC. We always tell them what we're doing. We always get the permission. Um, we have agreement with them not to, to go inside the, the wrecks. Um, but for the Germans, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting history for them where, one, they want to honor that they're men, of course, right? Um, and the technology is pretty astounding. But then you have the other part of the story, which is the, the, the politics that came into it in World War II, which they do not want any part of. So um, it's, it's, been, it's been challenging, but we're always very uh, open with them and communicating, but we haven't actually had um, folks really reaching out too much, though. And it's, you know, it's challenging for them. It's not a part of their history they're, they're proud of. You said that uh, for the monitor, there was some initial thought that uh, the ship would have rested away in 50 years, mm -hmm. and there's some new thought on that, I guess. Uh, for preservation, have like there been any sacrificial anodes attached to it? Yeah, th there were initially. So, but what we found was that there's doing uh, preferential uh, corrosion was happening. So, what we thought we we did attach anodes to the wreck. But what we found is that directly where those were connected, the metals and the iron plate were doing great, but just further from it, it accelerated the corrosion. So we decided to stop that altogether. Um, but to be honest, the wreck is in really good shape. Um, it's almost astounding for being down there for about 156 years. But uh, uh, other than what we have done to it for those recoveries, the armor belt is still completely intact and the wreck is actually cocked up to one side and the, the deck because it's upside down, it's still totally intact and straight and true as well. So it's it's in really good shape. You know, I think those initial studies they did back in the 80s, I don't think they just quite had a handle on metal, metal corrosion as, as well as today. But what we know today, it's in good shape. So how much has NOAA and other organizations spent on all of this over those years of work? And then what's the future funding look like? Well, uh, that, that's a great question. So uh, for those recoveries that we did, we did uh, uh, the lead funding agency was, was the U.S. Navy. So they have something called the legacy funds. Uh, so a lot of those funds went in there uh, in training and readiness. So what we didn't have time to get into was that when we worked on the monitor with the Navy, they put through every single Navy diver they have in their arsenal went through that project. So for them, it was a great way to give them their guys hands-on training with that type of equipment in the real world. These are also the same gentlemen who go around the world and women um, to do the, the airplane recoveries. It's the same crew. So um, I don't know how much they put in, but I could tell you it was substantial. But from the NOAA standpoint, uh, we put in for the Monitor Center probably $11 million with additional two going to the Conservation Center. And every year we give the museum up to $250,000 to, to deal with the artifact conservation, the curation, and the exhibit for these things because we, we own it, we're responsible for it, and um, that'll go on to perpetuity. So, so what's the future funding look like? For, for, for NOAA? Uh, well, in terms of the, the monitor sanctuary, it looks, looks very good. Um, we're, we're very lucky. Um, you know, a, a lot of things in the preservation field these days have challenges. Um, but we're a little bit different because we, we, our emphasis is on heritage. It's on honoring veterans um, and sort of valor and things. And those, those items have resonated with um, the administration. So we've, we've done quite well. So we've, we've done all right. But, but it is challenge, challenging for other sister sanctuaries who don't um, perhaps have those same resources we do. Any other? Yep. Yeah. 
Thank you. This has been a wonderful presentation. I've really enjoyed it very much. Um, uh, as, a, a, um, um, as a diver and someone who's gone diving on wrecks both here in North Carolina and elsewhere, I find this just fascinating. I've got all sorts of questions, but the two uh, that I have in mind related to the monitor, um, I've, I've seen how wrecks have been have deteriorated pretty quickly in different waters. There are two different currents colliding off Hatteras, the Labrador and the Gulf Stream. So what's the, what's the water temperature at 230 feet? Uh, well, that's... We were talking earlier, so that's one of the beautiful things about Cape Hatteras is uh, you never know, right? Because these two currents collide literally right over the monitor site. So I've been there, and the Labrador is murky and green. The Gulf Stream is clear and blue. I've been there, and it literally looks like blue's on one side and green's on the other side of the boat. Um, so if you're lucky enough, and that day is the Gulf Stream, at the monitor at 230 feet, it can be 78 degrees. You can see for 150 feet. I've been on the bottom... Usually my apparel is going to be a pair of surf trunks and a rash guard, and I can look up and I can see the boat. Mm -hmm. um, there have been other times where I've dove it and the water temperature plummeted 40 degrees from the surface, and I can't see my feet, and then my legs disappear, and then I'm in pitch black. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, it all depends. It's a super dynamic environment. But most times, you're going to get that Gulf Stream, and it's at least 180 to 100 feet of viz and probably 75 to 80 degrees on the bottom, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. I say it's some of the best diving in, in, the, in the U.S. Clearly is off North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other question I have is in removing the turret, mm -hmm. it was found with the turret sort of wedged underneath the ship. Mm -hmm. um, how was that brought out? I mean, I saw the crane go down and pick it up, but that assumed that there was nothing on top of it. It seems somehow or another the turret had to be pulled out from underneath before it could be lifted. <laughs> it was a magic trick. No, the, um, we did, working with the Navy, we actually removed that section of armor belt that was on top of it that has been moved out away from the wreck, placed in the seafloor, and then we had some decking that was on top of that as well, so that was actually brought up, and then that cleared the way for the engine, which is on top of it, which we brought up, and then the turret itself. So that, that's kind of how we did it, but it was, it was amazing because the, the Navy is fantastic what they do, but... They're used to cutting through an airplane wing, right? That's just metal. So they had to deal with iron and then wood and then other materials. So they would cut through one part, and then it would stick on the different material. They'd have to switch to a different blade, and it was probably one of the most challenging things they ever did. But um, we couldn't have done it without them. But, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's all for questions, I guess, then. Thank you very much, Mr. Casterly, and thank you all for joining us today, and please join us next week for more events. A good afternoon. Thank you.